Bonjour, everyone. So let me just say um, two things. Number one, I've been in a lot of startup communities before. So I've been to the New York startup community, which is where Photocracy is from. Uh, I've been to San Francisco, been to New Orleans, been to Detroit. And this is actually one of the coolest communities I've seen. Just like the vibe is really, really awesome. Uh, and my host, um, Soshape, uh, which is a startup here, told me that the family was a really great place to present and for everyone to really come together and be helpful. And uh, I you know, didn't really believe him until I got here. And everyone is just super nice and super helpful. So you guys are, are awesome. Um, second thing is the topic that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's in two parts. The first part is about photography and the, uh, the story behind it. A lot of what I'm going to say is actually, it's, it's very candid, so I'm not going to bullshit you. Um, everything's going to be completely transparent, and there are actually parts that I would like to kind of be kind of off the record, if possible. Uh, but I'll share it with you guys. If I say something's off the record, please don't tweet it. Please don't include it in the video, if possible. Um, is, that, is that possible? Okay, sweet. Uh, and then the second part is, um, this actually goes very well with what Usama was talking about, because I know he was talking about retention. And I'm actually going to be talking a lot about activation, which is the step above retention, and I actually didn't know he was talking about retention, but this goes very well with, um, with I guess, my part of photography. Uh, sorry, my part of the, the presentation, so I'm, I'm very glad that it turned out that way. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the story behind photography. So photography is a fitness social network with two million users. The first thing you'll notice about photography over all the other apps in the App Store, by the way, am I talking too fast? Please let me know. Um, sweet, okay. Uh, the thing about photography um, that differentiates it between all the other apps in the App Store is the design is, is really pretty, right? If you look at, um, here's what we have in the iPhone store and the app. Uh, you look at most fitness sites, and it's mostly dudes with their shirts off who are like, like flexing and like girls with like, you know, um, kind of scandalous clothing. And it's very, very poorly designed. Photography is, is we like to uh, spend a lot of time on design and making sure that it's beautiful so that somebody who uses photography and wants to get fit for the first time is not going to be intimidated. So photography today, uh, it's got two million users, including Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, who's, you know, the governator, uh, was one of Time Inc.'s 10 startups to watch um, in uh, last year uh, from New York. Uh, was Times, one of Time's top sites in 2014, uh, one of the one of Inc's ten most innovative fitness companies, and it's got the highest highest um, engagement out of every social network except for Facebook. So users will spend five hours per month. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what they were doing on photography, but they spend all this time on photography. They come back even on days they, they don't work out. Um, this is off the record. We do about a million in gross revenue, which is only from this year, and we can talk a little bit more about monetization. Now, I don't say this to brag, even though it does kind of sound like we're bragging. I say this because I want to talk about how we got there. And we got there despite the fact we had no fucking clue what we were doing. Like none, none at all. Um, in fact, here's our first version of photography. How do you say in French, like la mer, how do you say like piece of shit in French? <laughs> la mer, yeah. So that was our first version of photography. So me and my partner programmed photography not knowing anything about coding. And we pretty much begged our friends and family to use it. Um, myself and my partner, neither, neither of us had a programming, programming background. I started marketing um, in undergrad, and I literally learned how to how to code for photography's sake. And this is this is the first version that we came out with. Who here has a startup, like is founding a startup? All right. So out of everyone who's raising their hand, who's founding the startup for the first time? Oh wow. Okay. So a lot of people. So for you who for those of you who are starting a startup for the first time, I mean, this kind of gives you hope, right? Like if if we can have this piece of shit like actually succeed, then you guys whoever you are, probably have more tech skills than we do, and, and there's a, a good probability. Shit. Sorry, I curse a lot. I'm, I'm really weird I haven't dropped an F-bomb yet. Um, it's, it's highly probable that, there we go. Highly probable that you are going to be better off uh, than, than we were at the very start. So I'll tell you how two people who were not programmers um, and had no startup experience ended up getting to 2 million users. And we'll go, like I said, this is going to be very candid, and we'll, we'll go from um, 
each milestone that Photocracy went to. Because going from zero to 5,000 users versus going from 5,000 to 50,000 users versus going from 50,000 to 100,000 users, those were all very, very different. Um, of those of you who have startups, how many of your startups are community focused? Anyone? Community? Okay, great. So only a few hands. So every startup uh, can be community focused, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So to go from zero to 5,000 users, the only thing that we had, not knowing how to code, not knowing what our product was going to be, the only thing that we had was our founder story, right? So when I say founder story, I used to be a super fat kid, and uh, my partner used to be a super skinny kid, and we created this fitness social network, this fitness platform, and our positioning to our new users was that, look, we know how to get fit, right? That was really the only thing that we had to write on. And so we created this awesome founder story. And that's really, you know, in, in times when you have all of these sites competing for, uh, for landscape in, in different startup segments, and it's super saturated, your founder story is something that you can default on in order to get users. Because no matter who you're competing against, if you're, even if you're competing against Uber or Facebook, uh, we were competing against Nike Plus, Fitbit, et cetera. But what we had going for us was our founder story. So we had before and after pictures of me and my partner, uh, you know, what we used to look like before versus after. And we used that in order to get users. So we leveraged existing communities. Um, and we were completely authentic the entire time. So we created that. Let's back up. We created this piece of shit version of photocracy. And then we went on Reddit. And we said, hey, Redditors. You guys familiar with Reddit? Is there like, re OK. So we went on Reddit and we said, hey, Redditors. We went on the Reddit fitness sub forum. And we said, try out our site. We're geeks like you. Because um, that's how we position ourselves, was as geeks. And check out Photocracy and give us feedback. See how it is. I remember me and my founder, when we originally did that, we were going to this like meetup, like a meetup like this. And every time somebody signed up for Photocracy, we would get a text message. I, I programmed it so that like, yeah, we get a text message. And it wasn't very much every day because like my mom would sign up and like her friends would sign up and it was like maybe three text messages a day. Then we went to this meetup and all meetup, my phone was going off the hook. I think I got like, like literally 500 text messages. By the time I got home, we had three or 4,000 signups from Reddit. And the reason is because we found an existing community we were authentic in our message, and we said, we have no clue what we're doing. Here's a before and after, and try out our site. Because of that, we got to about 5,000 users with Reddit, right? And again, throughout this entire time, when I talk about scale, I, I want to emphasize over and over again that we, don't know what, we did not know what we were doing, and I'm only able to tell this story looking back. Right? I could have never predicted it going forward. So the best thing that I can do is tell you guys what we did in hopes that you find the best parallels between photocracy and your startup. So to go from 5,000 to 50,000 users, here's what we did. <laughs> I'll call this right up there. Um, so Usama, I believe, talked about a, um, what did he, what did he say? A, um, not velvet rope, but like a, what was that word? I'm talking about like a red carpet, red carpet, yes. So oh, this is off the record. So here's what we did with photocracy, because this is very, 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 um, a very successful strategy and every startup that I've helped who've, who's used this strategy uh, has been able to replicate it. Um, so don't tell your friends about this, but we had an invite code. And if you wanted to sign up for Photocracy, you had to put your name on a waiting list. If you had an invite code, then you could go ahead and sign up. For everyone who signed up for Photocracy, they had 10 invite codes. And so what would happen was mir miraculous. When somebody signed up for Photocracy, they would get 10 invite codes, and they'd be so fucking proud of their invite code, there we go, F-bomb, that they would go back to their home forums. So they'd go back to their favorite site, their favorite forum, and say, look, I have 10 invite codes for Photocracy. Here's my invite code, sign up. When those 10 invite codes ran out, all of their friends from their forum would be like, don't worry, I have 10 other invite codes. So sometimes we'd get somebody bringing the invite code to a new forum, and then that forum would get us like 5,000 users in a day. It was, it was pretty miraculous, right? Um, and that's something you can replicate depending on your startup, right? If you have an e-commerce startup uh, or like a community, if you make it invite-based, then you can totally replicate this on, on your own startup as well. Um, and having some sort of vel or, you know, red carpet or, or velvet rope is, is a very, very good, um, good strategy for getting users because people want what they can't have, right? And so if you put people on the wait list, they're going to want to sign up for your site. 
uh, we found early adopters and we found industry evangelists. So we thought about this. We were like, okay, we're getting a lot of people signing up for photography. Um, and just for context, photography, it's a fitness social network that turns fitness into a game, right? So you join photography and you can get points for working out, right? And so the people who signed up were very like average Joes. They were people who had never worked out before, they'd never had success working out before. And so we thought about, okay, if these people are signing up for photography, who would want to use photography as a distribution network? Oh, fitness professionals, right? Fitness bros would totally love to come on photography. If you get Arnold Schwarzenegger on photography, he has a new user base. Um, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is a bit of a stretch because he already has a user base, but let's say you have a trainer right, who has some followers online, but wants tens of thousands of followers. Well, that person will want to get on photography. So here's what we did. Uh, we would go to different cities. I would go to different cities, right? I'd invite them to New York, and then I would get them drunk. Seriously, I would get, uh, we, I would like buy them drinks, and alcohol is a very, very high ROI tool. I'm not even, I'm not even like fucking with you. ROI is like, or alcohol is one of the, the best things you can use for when it comes to um, business development. And it's because, when you take somebody and you get them drunk, what do you guys talk about? You talk about girls or boys, you talk about like your life, but then you talk about business, right? Inevitably, when you get somebody drunk, you will inevitably talk about business. And so relationships were definitely built around getting these fitness professionals drunk and, you know, not for the intention of, of using them, but like for building camaraderie. And then once that relationship was built, you can get them on photocracy. We got them on photocracy and we said, okay, well you can get new users on photocracy and you can also bring your existing users in. So we were able to grow from 5,000 to 50,000 users by these methods. Velvet rope, finding the early evangelists, making relationships with them, which, I mean, you don't have to get them drunk, but that it does help. Um, and getting their followers on photocracy. To get from 50,000 to 100,000 users, um, there was a lot of luck involved. And I don't necessarily think it was really luck. I think that once any business builds enough critical mass, like if you build a business that has 50,000 consumers, eventually PR is going to find out about you. And so we got CNN, The Economist, uh, USA Today, um, all of these sites wrote about photocracy and wrote about how photocracy was turning fitness into a game. So then when we were at 50,000 to 100,000 users, then you start thinking like, we have 100,000 users. If you have 100,000 users, you can leverage network effects. You guys know what network effects are? It's like, yeah. Uh, network effects, it's like, we can get players who want 100,000 users to follow them and to learn about their brand, and they'll bring more users in. If they bring more users in, we'll have even more users in our user base. And more users in our user base means that we'll get other people in. So you can create partnerships that way. So we reached out to a bunch of different partners. One of the partners that we reached out to was Red Bull. Right? So Red Bull has a very innovative marketing campaign. Uh, they really like new distribution sites, new distribution networks, uh, innovative ways to get people to follow the Red Bull brand. So we said, hey Red Bull, we have 100,000 users. Would you want to do a partnership with Photocracy? So we um, got Red Bull to sign up with Photocracy. They sponsored an event with Photocracy. They advertised, they paid for advertise. They not only paid for advertisement for users to use Photocracy, but they also, um, they also paid us in order to, they paid us like $100,000 in order to, uh, that's off the record by the way. They paid us $100,000 in order to have this, uh, this campaign with Photocracy. So you see what we're doing here? We're building a user base. We're getting people who wanna get that user base to follow them, we're bringing those people in. Those people are bringing in more users and you're bouncing off all of these, all of these different players, right? Um, so that's like the, the biz dev side of growth hacking. Um, and uh, you know, it, it ultimately came down to realizing what do professionals want? Red Bull wants followers. They'll bring in more followers if they can get our followers. Fitness professionals, they want followers. Um, they'll bring in their followers. And, and once we realize what everyone in this kind of ecosystem wants, it helps us grow. grow. Help us, yeah, help us grow. So to get from 100,000 to 200,000 users, we, we did absolutely nothing, right? We focused on our product, we built the product up. Once you get that sort of critical mass, then it's a lot easier, right? Because success begets more success. And so we just focused on our current user base, making them happy. The stuff that Usama said, focused on customer service, focused on retention, focused on making sure that everyone was happy. And that doubled our user base. Uh, so 
I'll give you a little bit of a timeline. We launched our beta in March of 2011. By November 2011, we were at 100,000 users. By January of 2012, we were at 200,000. 200,000 very, um, 200, very qualified users. Um, yeah. To get from 200,000 to 800,000 users, we started an iPhone app. So we actually started Photocracy just with a web app, with that crappy web app that you saw that we got like looking a little bit better and better. And let me tell you about what happened so that we were able to build that iPhone app. By getting traction from the web app, we were able to recruit talent. Um, we had our first chief technology officer. He was a chemical engineer in Austin, and he quit his job in Austin as a chemical engineer, moved up to New York, Literally quit his job, sold all of his stuff, packed up, moved to New York in order to work with us at Photocracy for just equity. We didn't even pay him. Um, and then eventually we used that traction in order to get investors to invest in, in Photocracy. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But the, the central theme here is that traction, getting users, vanity metrics, right? which aren't necessarily the, the best metrics to build a business on, but they're very, very good metrics in terms of recruiting people, getting VCs, and just making your startup look sexy, right? So because we were authentic as founders and because we were able to build this passionate user base and get traction, uh, all these people wanted to work for us. So it was very easy for us to recruit. So that's how we recruited our first CTO um, and how our site stopped being crappy because I'm, I'm not, well, I was technically the first CTO, but I'm not a programmer. Uh, but just because we, we built a passionate following, we were able to uh, recruit people along the way like that. Uh, so we got to 800,000 users. Um, we rode this PR wave. Um, all these people wanted to write about photography. We were on more sites. We were on Dr. Oz. We were on CNN again. Uh, we've been on CNN multiple times. And, and we just rode this wave. Uh, and then we were like number 50 on the App Store at some point, like number 50 overall, like above the Bible. Um, yeah, I know, right? Uh, above the Bible, um, just because all these people were downloading photography. Um, the last thing we did is we started leveraging growth hacking. I'll talk a little bit more about growth hacking. Um, the metric that we were able to optimize that helped was optimizing activation. So it's one step up in the funnel uh, before the retention metric. And I'll talk, I'll talk more about that. But that's when we started leveraging growth hacking. And you know, if we had started leveraging growth hacking early on with a shit product, that would have never, ever, ever gotten users. Right? So there was a baseline that we had to hit in order for users to convert and in order for growth hacking to work because you can't growth hack a bad product, right? You can't market a bad product. Eventually people will, will figure out, well, this is a piece of shit. This, it like looks like shit, smells like shit. Um, and if you try to market a bad product, it's just gonna backfire. Um, to get from 800,000, so we're 800,000 users right then. Uh, that was in January of 2013. To get from there to 2 million users, that's when we really, really started turning on the gun. So we were like, okay, we have 800,000 users. How do we get to 2 million? Uh, so we partnered with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and here's how we partnered with him. Uh, I basically got really drunk with somebody in his advisory board, and then that person uh, became friends with me. He introduced me to Arnold Schwarzenegger's social media guy, and then I was able to approach him. He already knew about photography, and, and I was able to say, look, photography has like 1 million users, right? Uh, do you want to partner with photography? Look, Arnold, if you want to build your own app, you can do that. It's probably going to be $50,000 or so. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't need reach, right? He has hundreds of millions of people who know who he is, but what he didn't have is he didn't have the ability to, um, to engage his users in a way that was valuable to him. Of course, he could engage them on Twitter. He could engage them on Facebook, but he didn't have a way to engage them on an app that was able to give people points for working out. And for him to be able to do that, uh, you know, he'd have to build his own app. And that didn't make sense for him, right? So it goes back to understanding what your potential partners want. We knew that Arnold already had a big name, and he didn't need more, more followers. What he did need was an app that could partner with him and, and um, really engage users. So we partnered with Arnold, and we got from 800,000 to 2 million users that way. Um, we did that because we did a little bit of social hacking from that, right? Like, uh, the two, two things I have up there, social proof and appearing important. Um, when we approached Arnold, we used a lot of social proof. Uh, we looked for all the advisors on his advisory board. So Arnold has a fitness advisory board. And we made sure we were friends with all those guys. 
and all those guys were on photography and all those guys were using photography and really happy with it. And so when we approached Arnold, we were like, dude, you already have like all these advisors on your advisor board uh, using photography. So it was an easy, easy sell. Um, you know, appearing important, uh, you know, you, you don't want to, to obviously oversell yourself in, in that way, but um, a lot of success in startups and success in, in different industries, your industry might be different, is about appearing like you are the player who's going to win. Right? And you do that through making friends. And you do that through making sure that people in that industry know who you are and know that you are, are very, very passionate. So it comes down again to authenticity and, and traction. Um, so even if vanity metrics, you know, I don't really believe in them to build a business, but they're great for social proof. They're great for, um, they're great for making other people in the industry know how much traction you have. Um, so that's how photography got, essentially got to, uh, got to two million users. Uh, what the hell? What we found out was that um, Facebook users were more likely to invite their friends because they would post on photocracy, or they would post on their social networks uh, about working out. Um, it played a role. I will tell you, it did not play as big of a role as we thought it would. So in 2012, everyone was obsessed with this idea of virality and growth hacking. They were obsessed with this, this idea of this factor, the K factor, um, and being able to grow exponentially. So we spent a lot of time, this is a mistake on our part, we spent a lot of time focusing on focusing on um, on Facebook growth. Now that's a problem because when it comes to social networks like photography, um, people are very very hesitant about. There we go. People are very very hesitant about sharing things on a fitness social network, right? And so we thought that people would share things on photography like they share on Instagram, like they share on Facebook, and we put in a lot of, a lot of engineering effort to optimizing virality on Facebook. And what we found out is like no one wants to share their workouts because it's embarrassing to them. So the one thing I would say is that like while Facebook is probably, you know, you probably want to incorporate it, um, it really depends on your business, right? And some businesses, uh, and some startups, some, some um, you know, concepts and domains just don't lend themselves very, very well for virality. So the answer to that is authenticity and knowing the domain. So fitness is one of the most saturated of all domains. And all the products that were in the market had founders, but the founders never made themselves known. So fitness companies like Daily Burn, MyFitnessPal, MapMyFitness, MapMyRun, no one knew who the founders were. So me and my partner made ourselves very, very transparent. Um, and making ourselves transparent and authentic, that allowed a grassroots community to come in because they were like, okay, these founders are putting, them, putting themselves out there. Uh, and if you're looking for, let's say, you know, you want to change your life with a fitness app. You can use, you can use MyFitnessPal with a big community, so a big app. Um, you don't know who the founders are. Or you can use Photocracy, where the founders talk to everyone every single day, and you know that they already have uh, before and after transformations. Um, a lot of people would opt to use the latter, right? And so if you're penetrating a really big, <laughs> penetrating, penetrating a really big market, then what you really need to do is, is make sure that the founder story is, is really tight. Yep. Okay, so we're gonna spend a little time talking about, oh, sweet, talking about uh, growth, vanity metrics, and activation. So activation is really the, um, Activation is really a metric that allowed photocracy to, to go gangbusters if there were any metric to focus on. Um, who here watches American football? Yes, okay, so some people. So in American football, there is this concept, there's this um, people who play for what's called an offensive line. Now you don't see what the offensive line does, because uh, in football you have stars, you have the quarterback, you have the running back, but if you have a better offensive line, your entire team is better. And that's kind of like growth. If your startup, has a lot of growth, even if it's vanity metrics, which won't build a business, uh, it acts like a good offensive line. So a good offensive line is going to allow you to get traction, right? It's going to allow you to, oh my God, I hate PowerPoint. It's going to allow you to get enough traction so that, let's say, um, let's say investors are willing to, and they might not be good investors, but you know, you're able to get enough traction for investors to invest in your product. Um, so the uh, offensive line, allows for network effects to occur, fundraising, monetization. Basically, the more growth that your startup has, the more it improves the entirety of the startup, um, especially when it comes to morale. One thing that we notice with employee morale is that if you focus on one growth metric and you have that on display, so we use something called Gecko Board, 
And uh, Gecko Board allows everyone in the company to see how much photography is making revenue, how much, how many you know, users are signing up every day. Um, and employee morale rises and falls with Gecko Board. Uh, so it's very good for morale. And so the, the concept of growth is, is very much like the offensive line. Uh, unfortunately, you have two things, right? You've got vanity metrics and you've got metrics that matter. Uh, Osama talked a little bit about this. Vanity metrics are, are things like registered users, right? If you have a million registered users but only 500 are paying, registered users are, are kind of a shit metric, right? And let's say only like 10,000 of them are active. It doesn't matter if you have a million registered users if only 10,000 are active. And the, the fact of the matter is that real growth it really is not that sexy, right? Focusing on activation, focusing on raising your activation rate from 10% to 30% is really not as sexy as going from 100,000 to a million users, even if that might be better. So this is from a different presentation. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, about photography, some photography. So we're going to look at the funnel, uh, the growth funnel. Um, and it's a framework created by this guy named Dave McClure, a very you know, successful um, smart venture capitalist. And he has this funnel called the R funnel, R like a pirate. Uh, it goes acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, and re referral. Um, we're going to focus on the activation part of things. So activation is essentially the first thing that somebody does on your site before they realize value. Right? So think about that magic aha moment. For every site, activation is going to be different. So for Facebook, um, their activation was getting seven friends in 10 days. Right? That was the aha moment. If you use Facebook and you did not get seven friends in the first 10 days, then you did not activate, you did not realize the full power of Facebook. Once Facebook figured that out, they grew like gangbusters. Right? They were able to get to you know, billions of users once they figured out that we need to make sure that everyone on Facebook gets seven friends in 10 days. And they were able to trade off, they were willing to trade off a lot for that. If you first sign up for Facebook, you get pummeled, absolutely pummeled with, with ads and, and call outs telling you to add your friends, even if it's to the point of being annoyed. Because they know that unless they get you to add those seven friends, you're not going to use Facebook. So let's go through a few, a few other sites. Uh, MailChimp, what do you think their activation is, right? Like what's the aha moment? Anyone? Yeah, yep, probably getting, getting an email on Facebook, or on, on MailChimp, that's probably the aha moment. Uh, what about OkCupid? Okay that's my profile, by the way. <laughs> that's a cat, by the way. That's not a towel. Date, getting a date, yeah, getting a match, right? What about Snapchat's activation? <laughs> Probably sending a dick pic. I'm just kidding. Um, so photography's activation was uh, that's photography. Uh, it's an interesting site. You have people logging. You have people doing everything from logging workouts to posting pictures of their cat. So many people post pictures of their cat on Vitocracy, and I don't understand this phenomenon, but anytime you have a social network, everyone is going to post pictures of their cat. So for us, it was interesting to figure out, like, what is activation in Vitocracy? So we dug through all of our metrics, and this is an exercise that everyone should absolutely do, is once you have a good collection of data, figure out what is the one metric that correlates to people staying, right? So we dug through everything on Vitocracy, and we noticed that everyone on Vitocracy who stays tracks a workout. They all track a workout. Even if you can do all these things on photography, if you don't track a workout, you don't stay on photography. And the reason is because when you track a workout, then you're, you get this dopamine hit, right? You get points. People like your workout, they prop your workout, they follow you, and it's like, oh, okay, I understand what the site's about. And so once we figured that out, we started optimizing, optimizing for tracking a workout in photography. And so we cut out all this crap on photography. Um, before you had to go through all these different steps to track a workout. You were put into the home stream, you were like given a lot of messages. We cut out all that bullshit and we just focused on tracking a workout. And what happened was that people, we realized that people who logged a workout were 60% more likely to stay. So when we improved tracking a workout, we improved activation, retention went up as well. So on the left you have activation on day zero. On the left you have activation on day zero. Once we improve that, retention automatically improved. It was, it was almost like, like magic, right? There are sites who, so good question about um, you know, existing sites and existing services are around. There are sites who were around before Photocracy. So Photocracy is a social workout site. There was actually a site called socialworkout.com and no one really, they never really got traction. So when we looked at socialworkout.com, here's why. 
where's activation on this site, right? Like, what are you supposed to do to start? There are so many things you can do that it never funnels you to one place. And I really, like, I really can't see a site like this growing because they don't focus on activation. And if you don't focus on activation, like, nothing else fucking matters, right? Like, if a user doesn't add seven friends in 10 days on Facebook, they're not going to stay on Facebook. So what does Facebook have to lose by telling every single fucking one of their users to friend people in the first 10 days, even if they annoy the shit out of them? Nothing. Uh, so if you think about retention, like retention, uh, this goes back to Osama's point, it, that is actual growth, right? Growth hacking is not about getting registered users, it's about getting retained users. And so if you want to get retained users, focus on retention and focus on activating those users because if user isn't activated, they don't stay. Yes, so the question is, users track their workouts in photocracy. How do you know they're not cheating? Um, and that was one of our concerns at the start. It was so much of a concern that we thought about partnering with gyms. What we eventually realized is that it doesn't really matter because the points don't lead to anything, right? The points are for fun. And if the points are only for fun, users are, are actually surprisingly reliable and, and transparent. Um, the one time that we had users kind of cheat on photography was when we allowed you to redeem those points for things. And we allowed, um, that's when we did the partnership with Red Bull. Um, we had a competition. The second we started introducing monetary value for points, that's when users started to cheat, right? Um, so if you don't have that monetary value part, then some users might cheat. But I mean, if you go every single day to log something to cheat, you're kind of a loser. Um, if you don't like, but you know, if you don't have that monetary value, then users don't really have that incentive. Yeah, so um, we thought about what Arnold wanted, right? And what he wanted was he wanted a platform where he could have a challenge, where he could challenge people. Um, he didn't need distribution. He didn't need followers because he already has a lot because uh, it's it's Arnold. So. What we realized is he really just needed a product that was able to do that. So we uh, networked with him, again, through um, developing relationships via alcohol, uh, networked with him, networked with um, his social media guy, and we really sat down with him and said, like, what do you want to do? And Arnold was like, okay, I really want to host a challenge. I want a challenge where I can get, like, like 100,000 people to sign up and make them do three minutes of working out every day. And for him to be able to do that on his own, he would have had to build his own platform. So what we said is, we said, okay, we'll incorporate that into photography if you get your followers on. Um, so it was really figuring out, again, that's one of my slides from earlier, figure out what these partners want. So we knew that that had, we knew that that had a, a limited ceiling, but it was a really good way to get traction onto the site. And so eventually we, we looked to see our growth and our growth was like this, you know, we went from like 100 to 200,000. We really wanted to be like at the millions. And we need to get to the millions. We had to have it open. Um, so it was really figuring out where the trade-off was. Like when does the, the steam stop, or when does the steam start to run out? Uh, and we figured that was around the, you know, 200,000 mark. And we also timed it with, um, with uh, January New Year's resolution because that's when everyone is really into fitness. So we figured, okay, January 2012 is when we're going to cut off the, the beta. So it was a matter of timing and figuring out like when, um, we started seeing diminishing returns. What we found out is most people sign up from the mobile application, but um, the users who stay are, are cross-platform. So people who are just using the mobile application is probably, I, I would venture to say, probably only 30 to 40% of our user base, right? So it gets, mobile gets a lot of users, but it doesn't keep those users until they get on the web platform, and it's because we found out that web is where all the deep engagement occurs, right? Like if you stay on photography, it's because you're following all these people, and we don't see a lot of social interaction on mobile. Uh, mobile is great for tiny interactions, like small comments, tracking a workout, but it's not really good for spending like an hour on photography, like finding out about different workouts. The, the number one mistake I think we made is that we, you know, uh, we talked about KISS metrics earlier, or Osama talked about KISS metrics. We didn't, um, we didn't use KISS metrics until, we didn't actually collect a lot of data until we were a good like eight months in. If we'd done that from the start, we would have been able to find all of those user patterns, and we would have been able to, to leverage them and make decisions based on data. Like, you always want to be making decisions based on data for two reasons. Number one, it's better to be making decisions based on data versus just guessing. Number two, uh, for those of you who have a startup, everyone has a co-founder, right? Most, more or less, yes. If you make a decision, uh, how many times you butt heads with your co-founder when you think, no, I think this button should be red, and your co-founder's like, no, this button should be blue. Um, that probably happens a lot. If you don't make decisions based on data, then one of the founders, like you, ba you basically butt head. So it's very good for company culture to collect data, and then when there's an argument, you use that data in order to make the decisions. Otherwise, 
um, the entire company loses because it becomes a he said, she said, like, I think I'm right, I, you, like, you think you're right type of thing. Um, so that's the one, the biggest mistake we didn't make, the uh, biggest mistake we made is we did not collect enough data at the start. Well, one thing I found out from photography is that one cool thing is that it drew a lot of fitness professionals, and so I was able to see a lot of different workouts, right? And um, I was able to, to figure out which workouts uh, were the best for somebody who has like 100 hours of, of work per week. Um, so it's, it's like using your own product, right? Which is like the best thing that can possibly happen. So I'm very lucky for that. So the monetization strategy we're doing right now is that um, we realize that photography draws a lot of fitness professionals and it draws a lot of users. And so we're allowing those fitness professionals to start groups where they can train the users. Um, the earlier monetization strategy, like the thing I mentioned with Red Bull, um, that was like an ad hoc, that was like a, a one-off uh, monetization partnership, and it probably was not very replicable. To replicate something like that, you'd need a sales team, and that's a very different business, right? Going after sales and ads is a, a very different business than we want to run. Um, so now what we're focusing on is uh, more organically monetizing by um, allowing trainers on photography to sell their programs to users. Well, thank you guys. If no other questions, I believe that's it. Thank you.